Hello and welcome everyone to the Thermographic Diagnostic Imaging and Health Through Awareness May webinar. My name is Leisha Getson and I will be your host. Before we begin, just a little housekeeping. The presentation will be about 50 to 60 minutes followed by a Q&A. You should be able to hear me as well as the speaker and follow the PowerPoint presentation. To the right of your screen, you will see a chat box. If you have a question, type it in and submit it and we will get to as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. If for some reason you get cut off from the webinar, you'll be able to log back in and fast forward to catch up. Also, all of the presentations are archived and can be found on our website at tdinj.com under the webinar heading. Okay, so let's get started. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening, Ann McLeod Sneath. Anne is a certified nurse practitioner who practices all aspects of women's health care, including gynecology. Anne is a former nurse midwife with 32 years of caring for women's issues. Anne specializes in holistic health using nutrition, blood work, saliva tests, bioidentical hormones, exercise plans, herbs, herbal remedies, and natural supplements for wellness. Anne is also a practitioner that listens, guides, and encourages women to reach their goals in weight, energy, and wellness. And I think that bears repeating that Anne listens, guides, and encourages. Anne has a very gentle, calm demeanor, and she is truly a gifted healer. Anne, we're so grateful to have you with us this evening. Welcome. Thank you, Leisha. It's a real pleasure to be here. So let's get started. We're anxious to hear what you have to tell us. Okay, so I've actually brought about 11 slides that I'm going to go through. Um, the first one, um, so obviously the subject of this discussion, and I do want it to be a discussion so people can ask questions and we can have a running dialogue um, not only through the actual showing of the slides, but the at the end for questions. Right. So this discussion is about the environmental link to hormone, hormones disruption and breast cancer. And we're going to talk a lot about the difference between uh, phytoestrogens, which are plant-based estrogen substances, and xenoestrogens, which is the fancy biochemical term for um, estrogen mimics that are found in the environment, and they're extremely disruptive, and they cause breast cancer. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the weight factors in hormone disruption, and I know lots of women, especially here, a lot about having kind of a middling um, weight, and one of the issues around that in relationship to breast cancer is that a lot of these chemicals are stored in fat cells, whether they're breast cells or abdomen cells, and um, they are... Uh, really contributing to diabetes, polycystic ovarian syndrome, irregular menstrual periods, and heart disease. And then really the gist of this discussion is about consumer education and looking at what we're buying and what we're using and where we're going with um, prevention of breast cancer uh, because we're, we're going to be educated about the environment. That sounds um, oh, sorry? I said, that sounds great. That's what we need to learn about is prevention. So I want to, first of all, have a disclaimer that I am not in any way associated with any product or um, industry um, that is going to be mentioned in this discussion. Um, so when you look at this diagram, and I'm going to give credit to the diagram from the, that it's from a book called State of the Evidence, which was written by Janet Gray, a PhD who is funded by the Breast Cancer Fund. And the mission of Breast Cancer Fund is to identify, eliminate um, environmental causes of breast cancer. So basically what they do is they educate and they fund these researchers um, that are looking at all of these chemical hazards um, related to breast cancer. 
And how do they, the, I guess the, the most important question when you look at this diagram is how do they know? Um, and they know because they're finding these chemicals in breast cancer tumors and they're finding them in breast milk, blood, urine, um, and so they're able to identify um, some of these environmental hazards that we're exposed to on a regular basis. Um, again, I think this diagram is extremely daunting, um, but it also shows how sensitive breast cancer is and that, again, the purpose of this discussion is to educate, provide awareness, and so that we can make choices. Um, I want to differentiate between plant estrogens and what we've heard lots about soy. Um, I want to talk about the endogenous sources, which are our own ovaries, which produce um, hormones if they're if they're still going. Um, so when they go to sleep in menopause, um, that's very different than uh, or excuse me, when our ovaries are producing hormones, those are what we consider our natural endogenous hormones versus these exogenous or xeno hormones that we're getting in the environment. And they've been talking about how there's like 85,000 different synthetic chemicals that are used in the United States today and only 7% or greater than 90 percent, less than 90 percent are actually tested for their effect on human health. So this is the quintessential putting the cart before the horse. Um, you put the chemicals out there and then you find out later that in fact they are harmful to humans. Um, this is a typical un and unfortunate uh, kind of drama that plays out in the United States in that we need to focus more on prevention. And one of the, um, the scientists that has been funded by Bre the Breast Cancer Fund, uh, Dr. Deborah Davis, talks about our lack of prevention is like the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff on a mm. hairpin turn versus putting a guardrail at the top of the curve. And again, that's what this discussion is all about, is having that guardrail so that we don't go off the cliff. Um, we know um, how to be safe. And I want to talk a little bit, especially about soy. Um, and we're talking about the Asian types of soy um, that are beneficial. And those types of soy are your fermented soy like tofu, miso, um, and even the soybean itself as an edamame are considered very beneficial. Um, the, the altered versions of soy such as these soy protein powders and um, all of these preservatives that are used in packaged food are the types of estrogens that can cause problems with the breast. So the, that soy is one of the plant estrogen mimics. So it, our body sees it as identical to our own estrogen, takes it up into the estrogen receptors, and then... Um, use it and then it becomes disruptive to the cells in the breast. Um, flax is also estrogenic, um, especially when you're menopausal or even perimenopausal, both soy and flax are very, very beneficial. Um, they won't necessarily cure hot flashes, but again, they are some of the safer sources of um, of estrogenic products that we can find naturally occurring in plants. Um, I can't emphasize enough that every single packaged food um, has some sort of soy protein isolates or soy lecithin. These are the altered soy products and of course if you eat an apple you don't have to check in and find out whether it has a preservative in it. So the, mi the mission here is to try to choose food that is not packaged um, because you don't then don't have to worry about what is contained in it. 
Um, I want to talk a lot more about how these chemicals are absorbed and what some of them are. Um, I, get, I know lots of people have heard about BPA. I'm going to talk a fair amount about that. But when you talk about the skin as being the largest organ in the body, anything that we put on our skin um, is absorbed directly into circulation and then into cells. So if we use our skin cream or our um, sunscreens, um, we're talking about repeated exposure a number of different times a day and that is I want to talk a lot more about um, the cumulative effect of some of these products and some of the chemicals that are contained in them so the different one of the things that we like about transdermal absorption is when you're using bioidentical hormones as a cream um, they are very readily absorbed and so when I explain to women about using progesterone or estrogen creams, I make a very um, strong point of saying, yes, look how easily this goes into your skin, and so does everything else, including your deodorant, your shampoo, your hair dyes, um, all of them contain products that we don't necessarily want to be absorbing into our circulation. Um, and it is, again, this repeated exposure um, on a daily basis to some of these things, some of these products that contain fragrance, um, some of these sunscreens that have peat, PABA, P-A-B-A, -A, and HMS in them. These, these uh, chemicals are actually estrogen mimics. So again, our body is tricked into thinking that this is the type of estrogen that is produced by the ovaries when in fact it is a very disrupting um, chemical from the environment. I'm going to talk at the end about some of the websites that you can go to and look at some of these um, additives and chemicals in our cosmetics um, that we want to avoid um, and find out what other products we can use um, and how we can better read labels to differentiate between products that I would say are clean versus products that are estrogenic. Um, some of the other um, products that are found in nail polish, um, they talk, there's been a lot of talk recently about nail salons and the people that work in these salons and some of the exposure that they have to some of these horrific uh, products like formaldehyde or toluene, um, which are all carcinogenic. Um, you can also find some of them in hand soaps, hair dyes, as I mentioned before, um, and that the average woman uses about 12 different products a day, and they will add up to about 126 different chemicals um, that we are exposing ourselves to. Um, even Walmart in 2008 actually banned some products that they felt had these toxic chemicals in them. So there is a little bit more of an evolution of awareness here. Um, I will talk about the, the phal phal phthalates and the BPA plastics a little bit further on. You have to be a biochemist to even pronounce yes, some of these. True. Um, I want to talk about, we did talk a little bit about the food sources of, end, or we're going to talk about the food sources of endocrine disruptors. One of the biggest ones I think that everyone knows about is bovine growth hormone. It is, its chemical name is Zoranol. It is an estrogen mimic. So I don't know if people remember, probably about 15 years ago, um, there was uh, this incidence of these young girls, eight and nine years old in Mexico that were developing breast buds. And they linked it to um, the growth hormone that was being used in meat um, and dairy. 
um, we still have it in this country. It is still used um, in our meat, dairy, and cheese. Um, and these, these products are very, very estrogenic. They're absorbed in the breast, they're absorbed in the ovaries, and they're considered endocrine disruptors in that they can not only cause cancer, but we are seeing evidence of early puberty in our own country. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Not only is our concern about the bovine growth hormone, but remember these cows and pigs and animals are also eating food that has been sprayed with pesticides and herbicides. We're going to talk about those as well because those are also considered um, estrogen-like substances. Um, everyone, as I said before, has at least heard of uh, bisphenol A. Um, it is a fat seeking compound um, that leaches into food from plastic when it's heated. Um, I think one of the scariest things I've seen in the last couple of years is hot dogs or potatoes that are wrapped in plastic and you're supposed to poke holes in it and put it in your microwave. Mm -hmm. That is an incredible source of estrogen and progesterone and it's certainly not the kind of estrogen and progesterone that our ovaries make. Mm -hmm. So again, you're talking about long-term repeated exposure to substances like BPA that cause the cells to divide and multiply and therefore can cause cancer. Um, they're talking about BPA is being found in breast and prostate um, cancer. Um, it also causes metabolic dysfunction and they're even linking it to some behavioral disorders. Um, they all, I know there's been quite a bit of uh, education about baby bottles that are made with BPA plastic um, and, you know, parents microwaving them. And again, you're talking about these uh, BPA leaching into milk. It's very fat seeking. Um, not only does it seek fat in the food, but it's also stored in fat um, in human beings. Um, it can be detected in blood and urine and breast milk. That's how they know that it's there. Um, and the exposure to this is much more detrimental in pregnancy, young children, and adolescents. So they're laying down these chemicals in their breast cells, and um, unfortunately, it's causing lots of problems in the future. One of the fascinating things about BPA is it goes down the same pathway as our own estrogen. So um, it's taking up the space in our estrogen receptors that our normal estrogen would take up. So in other words, it's sort of blocking the way, if you will, for our normal estrogen to go into that space because it's already occupied by an estrogenic substance like BPA. Um, they're also talking about it reducing BPA, reducing the efficacy of some chemotherapeutic agents. Um, because again, the cells are full of this chemical and the chemotherapy, um, um, excuse me, medications are not working because of it. Um, we know now also that we can detect these sort of bad estrogens in urine. And there's a number of really good uh, specialty labs out there that use urine to detect um, the estrogens of the 4-hydroxys, the 12s, and the 16s. And they can actually determine the ratio between these, how shall I say, bad estrogens um, that people are peeing out, and then you can um, you can actually correct this by using some other products that I'm going to talk about. Um, the other thing that goes along with plastic is um, uh, phthalate, phthalates. Um, these are a plastic softening project product. Um, they 
Uh, this is one of the main products that's found in urine, blood, and breast milk. It can even be uh, absorbed through the skin. This is one of the big uh, environmental estrogens that is responsible for early puberty. So these less than or equal to nine-year-olds are developing breast buds. They're starting to have early periods. And then what happens is this they increase their lifetime risk of breast cancer. Um, it also decreases sperm in men. And you start to wonder with all of this going on, uh, especially the decreased sperm count in men, if that is not a direct cause of all of the infertility that we're seeing um, in the United States. Mm. Certainly makes sense. Um, one of the big things that I think we're all exposed to is pesticides and herbicides. I mean, nobody's allowed to have dandelions in their yard anymore. I'm not sure where the law was written on that one. <laughs> um, but you've got all of these um, sprays and chemicals like um, methyl iodide, which is a nerve toxin, and atrazine, um, which is actually, um, atrazine is an herbicide, and that was banned in Europe in 2005 because they found that it changed the sex of frogs. Um, there's another one that is a uh, pesticide called clothionidin and that has what has been found to cause the bee colony crash and unfortunately this particular herbicide um, has a half-life of 19 years meaning that 50 percent of this herbicide will be around in the ground for the next 19 years wow that's scary um, it is, and again, it's unfortunate that these substances are produced and allowed to be used, and then we're like, oh my gosh, well, now that's a problem mm. um, instead of the other way around. Right. Yeah. And so they talk a lot um, in a particular book about the home garden exposure. We all, everybody likes to zap their weeds um, and have better plants and more beautiful plants and they talk about very simple solutions that people can use like vinegar salt and soapy water are a really good um, herbicide um, it also uh, prevents aphids from getting on the plants and none of of course vinegar salt and soapy water are certainly not carcinogenic um, the other thing about gardens and using these pesticides and herbicides is if you have these companies that come to your house and they spray, they tell you that your, dog, your animals and your kids cannot go on the lawn for 24 hours. Um, that should raise a red flag yeah. right there. Um, and also all of these products are leaching into nearby streams. Um, so all in all, there's nothing really good about it except that people want the perfectly green, beautiful lawn. Um, if you haven't seen the new guidelines on mammograms and we want to talk a bit about radiation exposure as one of the environmental aspects of breast cancer, um, it's actually been a very good thing that they have changed the guidelines in 2009. So when you go to your practitioner, you need to understand that we are not doing routine mammograms on women under 50 unless they have a very specific risk um, that would be either genetic or they have their own concerns. Remember that mammograms are ionizing radiation that also misses 20% of what is actually in the breast. Um, but the new guidelines, which I do approve of, um, talk about doing mammograms every other year between the ages of 50 and 75. Um, I have probably 50% of my patients will refuse a mammogram because they're very well educated. They've listened to Dr. Mercola. Um, they've listened to the Breast Cancer Fund. 
and so they've chosen thermography and I understand Leisha that you all are recommending thermograms every year um, as a means of prevention whereby mammogram is actually a detection um, of tumors even though these tumors may be found early um, it is not a preventive method um, whereby I believe thermography is yes and we we, we are recommending uh, or women I have to say women feel comfortable doing something once a year and thermography being completely non-invasive it's, it's a very safe choice and I think, you know, the other thing that I really liked about the guidelines of 2009 is that they do encourage self-breast exam. And again, I think when you women go to their practitioner for what we're now calling our well woman exam, um, because the... Um, the need to do pap smears, uh, there's new guidelines on that as well as how often women actually need pap smears due to the discovery of HPV and that that is exclusively the cause of cervical cancer. So now when you go to your practitioner and you're getting an exam, you have the opportunity to discuss um, whether or not you want a mammogram, how often, and hopefully they know something about thermography and if they don't, you now do. Um, so you should be taught how to do um, a self-breast exam and I, again I remind my patients this is not about looking for a tumor, this is about checking to see that your breasts feel normal to you. And I really love it when my patients come in and I'll be doing their breast exam and, they'll, and I'll say, oh well you know I feel this little ridge here and they'll say, oh, that's always there. That tells me that they are doing their breast self-exam regularly and that they know what their own breasts feel like and therefore if there is a change, they're going to come and say, I would like to have this evaluated. I just heard Dr. Getson talking about 3D ultrasound, uh, which is very diagnostic. Um, unfortunately, it's very difficult to get women to have an ultrasound without a mammogram. Um, but certainly, all women can have a thermogram. Uh, the other thing we want to talk a little bit about while we're here on mammograms and breast, uh, breast cancer detection is that we now know that there are lots of substances uh, in food that such as um, diendolmethane, uh, which is one of the, uh, it's actually found in broccoli and cruciferous vegetables. And this is actually an enzyme that is called, as I said, diendolmethane. Its short name is DIM. And I'm happy to say that it's being studied at the University of Arizona, where they're actually comparing um, the reduction of breast cancer, or, or the, excuse me, the, they're comparing breast cancer reoccurrence using either DIM or tamoxifen. And this is a huge, huge step in the right direction. Um, using something that is a naturally occurring enzyme um, that is what we call a serum estrogen reuptake and, um, modulator, which is what tamoxifen is. And so this is fantastic that you're actually doing the science on looking at a naturally occurring enzyme that's found in cruciferous vegetables. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's also the a lot of studies have been done on vitamin D3. Remember that you can go to your practitioner and they should be happy to test your vitamin D3. There's been quite a bit in the literature about what level of vitamin D3 is beneficial for women. And so when you have a blood test um, the range for uh, vitamin D3 is between 30 and 100. In women, 
we know because of research that women's vitamin D3 level should be 50. This is the most breast protective level for vitamin D3. Um, the other thing you should know about vitamin D3 is that it doesn't matter how much sun you've had. Um, we all are using hopefully a clean sunscreen and blocking the sun. Um, and a really good time to have your vitamin D3 checked is in September. Um, every, you know, whether you go in the sun or not, um, it also prevents seasonal affective disorder. So getting on a dose of vitamin D3 in September is a really good time of the year. Also remember that vitamin D3 knee is a fat soluble vitamin. It's not really a vitamin, actually it's a hormone and it should be, cons it should be taken in an oil base. So I'll have lots of women say, oh, I'm taking my magnesium and D3 and calcium, but it's a powdered form and they are not absorbing it and you prove it to them by checking their level of vitamin D3. Mm -hmm. Other things that are very beneficial for uh, breast protection are green tea, um, omega-3s, which can be found in either fish oil or flax oil. Um, and they are, uh, as I say, anti-inflammatory. So if we think of cancer as an inflammatory process, a virus, whatever, um, your anti, anything that is an anti-inflammatory um, is going to be very beneficial in prevention. Um, I also encourage my uh, patients to read um, what Dr. Mercola is saying. Um, and also, I think as women, we really have the uh, responsibility to start looking for safer screening methods. And again, looking at methods like thermo thermography that are looking for early prevention rather than detecting something that's already there. Um, and if you haven't gotten the gist of it, <laughs> that's what this entire talk is about. And I just have a couple of comments and a question. Sure. Okay. As far as um, uh, the for self breast exams, that's something that we highly encourage for uh, the reasons that you stated, but also because women are so disconnected from their bodies these days. There, there is such fear around breast cancer that women are just literally afraid to touch their breasts and there's a big disconnect going on. So uh, we recommend them, you know, obviously so that they get to know their breasts, they um, will feel if there's something different, but also to, to reconnect with themselves, reconnect with their own bodies. Uh, and uh, yeah, that, that's a good point. Yeah, that, you know, to try to take some of that fear, it, we, we're, we're just, everybody is so afraid of their breasts, and we're, we're not loving them the way we should be. Right, and I also, I think, um, I, I think that, you know, this whole, the whole issue around self-breast exam has been focusing on, oh, you're trying to see if there's anything wrong. Right. With, rather than flipping that and saying, no, that's that's really not why you're doing it. You're doing a self-breast exam to see how normal your breasts feel to you. Right. And that's that if you have and if you have any questions about that, then you're going to go to your practitioner. Um, and also be taught the other thing going back to thermography that is unique about thermography is that you do see the axillary region of the chest which is where you know we have hundreds of um, lymph nodes in the ax under the arm excuse me the clinical term axillary um, but underneath under the arm um, is an area that a mammogram will not show you so when you first and foremost you teach your patients to feel under their arms for any enlarged lymph nodes or anything unusual. Um, and remember too that when I talked about some of these uh, chemicals that are found in cosmetic products, you know, there's a huge link to, um, to uh, antiperspirants, deodorants that have some of these um, estrogenic chemicals in them that are going directly into the endocrine system through 
um, our lymph nodes, of which our chest, our breasts, under our arms, there's hundreds of them. Yeah. So yeah. one of the things, again, I emphasize to women about thermography is that you're going to see, um, you're going to be able to utilize thermography to see under the arm and to make sure that there's nothing going on there, whereas a mammogram will not do that. That's correct, yes. And just one other um, observation. We, uh, of course, recommend thermography. It's not the be-all, end-all. We recommend self-breast exams. And in some cases, women may need anatomic testing. Our uh, choice would be an ultrasound, in some cases, and an MRI in others. Now, we've been able to uh, develop a relationship with an ultrasound facility uh, in this area and they will allow our women to have an ultrasound without forcing them to have a mammogram. That's fantastic. Yeah, so you know it's not a law. Women think it's a law to that they have to have a mammogram before the ultrasound. So uh, we've been uh, successful in, as I said, uh, working out a relationship with a facility around us and Dr. Getson will call on behalf of patients in area, other areas, maybe in PA or North Jersey and, and in some cases, he is successful in, in uh, being able to talk to the radiologist. But more and more women are really just demanding, um, mm -hmm. the, you know, their, their right to have an ultrasound if they want so to. So true. Yeah. So true. And I think, you know, you, you open up a bit of Pandora's box because, you know, I get this question all the time from my patients. Why can't I just go have... Um, an ultrasound or, you know, why doesn't my practitioner understand about thermography? And that's because, you know, mammography is the, quote, standard of care. Right. Um, I do think that we've come a long way with these guidelines and the fact that women under 50 don't uh, need a mammogram unless they have certain risk factors. Um, I also, you also realize that um, this, these new guidelines are very similar to what's happened with pap smears because you're doing more harm than good. Right. So unless you know um, what the, you know, if you understand the exposure, if you understand the risk versus benefit, um, and, you know, all of these biopsies and, th and procedures that are being done on the breasts that were unnecessary. Um, right. And the, and now we have 3D mammogram, which is essentially, you know, four mammograms or actually two per breast. Um, and again, this was um, this was developed uh, to, uh, you know, to eliminate this this factor of quote unquote dense breasts, and that you have to see through this density um, so that you can. Uh, determine whether or not there's anything going on inside of this des dense breast. And, you know, again, it's the standard of care. Is it the absolute? No, it is not. Right. Um, does it make us any safer? Absolutely not. And, you know, then if you find something, you know, the other um, then going even further down, if there is something found, then, you know, the woman ends up getting four and five and six mammograms right. um, yes. to determine, you know, well, okay, is there really something there? And I've learned over the years the hard way um, is if women do have mammograms, I automatically write for an ultrasound so that they can go to that immediately because if you do see something suspicious on mammogram and but and you you can actually have better detection if it is um, followed up with an ultrasound at the same visit right yeah and then and again then if you if you do have a mammogram you can always have a thermogram the two are not exclusive of each other because you know as we know thermogram thermography gives a certain set of information that mammograms do not. And I think it's really important for women to understand um, this, this ability to see a circulatory pattern in the breast that may be a normal architectural pattern. 
um, that is indicative to their, you know, their breast, their breast structure, or is this a a pattern of um, circulation or what we call angiogenesis that is indicative of a tumor? Mm -hmm. um, and as I know, Dr. Getson has always explained to me, you know, this is five years out. I mean, we're talking about prevention that is uh, a possibility in the future or could be occurring right now, but it's very much more in advance of mammography. Yes. Yep. Eight, eight, se seven to ten years before. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Release. I said five. No, seven no, to ten really, years yeah, is better. It, well, it's uh, it. Well, from what I understand, it takes about um, seven years for the cells to become the size of an eraser head, and then only then is it um, readable on a mammogram or uh, palpable on a self-exam. But exactly. So provides a huge window. I'd just like to comment real quickly on the breast density. There is a now a breast density law in New Jersey where pe women are supposed to be told if they're under the age of 50 that the mammogram may be uh, inconclusive due to breast density. Of course, they're telling the women after they've had the mammogram, but that, that law is, is in effect in New Jersey. Uh, another great oh, wow. test is the MRI. Right. Uh, which we've tried to get, you know, we try to get our women, uh, what's the word, authorized for an MRI, but now they've actually said that the woman has to have a biopsy before she can have the MRI. Oh my gosh. Which is gosh. why that's what we're trying to avoid is the biopsy. So. I know. don't, we haven't, we haven't had that so much of that problem. I mean, I practice in Pennsylvania. Um, we're talking here in New Jersey. Um, we haven't had uh, that much of an issue uh, with women getting MRIs, um, which is the gold standard in many cases of actually identifying what is found. I want to explain what a magnetic resonance imaging or MRI is. Most insurance companies requ require a pre-certification, which essentially is begging on the phone for a half an hour. <laughs> that's correct. Um, that's what a pre-cert is. Um, but we have not had that problem in Pennsylvania. So we have a couple of breast specialists that I sometimes refer my patients to, and they will take the word of the thermogram or whatever your concerns as a practitioner are, um, and they will bypass the mammogram and the woman will be hopefully um, given the option of having an MRI by her insurance company. Um, wow. I know a lot of women would say that that's, you know, rationing of medical care. But uh, on the other hand, um, I do think we need to be a little bit discriminating with spending that kind of money um, unless it is absolutely necessary. I think, too, getting back to breast density, one of the things that's really important about doing any study of the breast is to always go and have it done after your period if you're a woman still having periods. Um, because, of course, we know that prior to the period, all of the hormones, estrogen, progesterone, even testosterone, are you know flooding the breast and the breast tissue and not only is that uncomfortable for a lot of women to have you know anything um, to do with their breasts except for of course thermography um, because you're not touching the breast but certainly mammogram uh, you definitely don't want to have a mammogram or even an ultrasound prior to your period. Go after your period at least a week or two where the hormone levels are at their lowest so that you can get a true picture so that if there is a little breast cyst there which is fluid filled, it's caused by the hormones and so it, it grows up prior to the period and then it disappears after the period. Um, so I always, and even doing your own breast exam um, they should, it should be done after your period so that you're feeling your breasts when they're the least exposed to um, your own body's hormones. That's, that's such a good point. I, I, I shudder to think how many 
uh, false diagnosis there have been due to the time uh, of month that the woman had the mammogram. Exactly. And you don't, you definitely don't want that. I want to go back a slide here um, and talk a little bit. I forgot to mention about um, the food sources that are good for us. So we talk a lot about don't do this, don't do that, watch out for this. Um, but I wanted to talk about some of the foods that um, are easily used as antioxidants. Um, one of the big ones is selenium. Selenium is a very, very strong antioxidant, meaning it's really good at preventing inflammation. Uh, the, the, the most common source of selenium in food is Brazil nuts. Um, I can't tell you the number of conferences that I've been to where they were talking about hormones and they were talking about antioxidants. And if you eat three Brazil nuts a day, you're going to get enough selenium to be prote protective. Um, we talked a lot about the green and red peppers, uh, talking about leeks and your cruciferous vegetables and talking about eating food that is not packaged, mm. um, food that we don't have to read the label on. Um, so that's one of the things I wanted to emphasize. And then I wanted to go to the last slide. I think that we as consumers, here's a couple of things that we can do. We really want to demand safer products. When I talked about BPA, um, you, the number of cans that are lined with plastic, um, this is again the same BPA that is leaching into our food. Remember that the food is put in the plastic lined can the food is processed using heat, so now it's absorbed uh, the BPA into the food, and then we're eating the food. Um, so one of the few companies, and Leisha, you probably know more, but um, even at the quote good food stores, um, the only cans that I've been able to find that are not plastic lined are beans and chickpeas and things like that from a company called Eden. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you knew of any more. I may have uh, some more listed on my website. Not, nothing is coming to mind at this moment. But I am okay. familiar with the brand Eden. Okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit too because I know we're running. We're going to be running out of time pretty soon. Um, but I know that I want to talk about this issue of guilt and the fact that when you have a conversation with your friend or neighbor that you know the worst thing that we can do is try to convince someone who feels guilty that they're not doing all of these things for prevention um, especially when they have younger children and I see it in my practice all the time. Um, I have a number of 15 year olds who come in, they are overweight, their mother is overweight, and th these 14 and 15 year olds are not having periods um, and they have polycystic ovarian syndrome. Mm -hmm. And you try to have a conversation with the mother in the room about some of these issues around the environmental hormones that they're completely unaware of and also the packaged food that they're eating, the amount of sugar that they're eating, and it's all disrupting their normal hormones. They're, you know, 15 years old, they weigh 160 pounds, wow. and they're not having periods. And you wow. try to try to have a discussion with the mother and the daughter in the room without making her feel guilty um, that you know she is essentially feeding her child food that is causing the problem without knowing it right you know certainly not intentionally and when you look at all the research on hormones in the environment the most disruptive is when um, these are these young women 20 and under are exposed to all of these products. That's really when the most damage is being done.
Um, again, not that that damage cannot be reversed, but that's why I talk about when I put this bullet in here about having conversations with people, we really want a model. I think that, I mean, Leisha, you might, you know, agree with me. We really want to model. We really, if people are interested in knowing, um, we're there to teach them. But on the other hand, you know, with our families and our husbands and our friends, um, we really don't want to make other people feel guilty. We want to educate them if they're willing. And otherwise, we want to be a role model. Right. And I, I totally agree with you, Anne. It's, um, if, you know, walk the walk, if you know, talk the talk, right? So I, I try to live my life in a certain way, but I don't ever offer that advice to people. If somebody wants to know, I wait for them to ask me. Uh, and then if they want to have a conversation about things, then we do. Uh, particularly difficult if you try to approach family members and um, get them to, to make changes. Right. And they have to be willing. It has to make sense to them. And, you know, so much of what we've talked about in this discussion about hormones in the environment is the fact that it's unseen. Right. It's not you can't point a finger at it and say, oh, there's the BPA in my tuna fish. Right. Um, you, it's not, you can't do that. And, you know, this whole issue of biochemistry is not myth. It's not my perception or your perception. It is data that is in the science. And again, if you think about the fact that, you know, breast cancer is only 10% genetic, that's 90% of it is coming from the environment. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I'm really happy that there are so many organizations out there such as CosmeticsDatabase.com. Again, you can look at the list of all the nasty ones um, and they will actually make recommendations of other products such as Levera, which does not have PABA in it. Um, there's another website that you see here, what's on my food.org. Um, there's tons of them. Uh, the other thing is to read labels. I mean, how many times have we heard that over and over again, you know, that if you can't pronounce it, then why do you want to eat it? Yeah, that's for um, sure. And also to ask questions. I mean, we women are the most powerful consumers in the United States. I mean, we have a tremendous amount of power. Um, and when I say to my patients who say, well, why do I have to have a mammogram? Why would I have a mammogram? Um, and I say, why? it's up to us to change it. It's up to us to make decisions based on science, not about our perceptions or myths that we've heard, but to really look at the science. And it's really interesting because some of these breast cancer organizations or, um, you know, um, charitable organizations are looking at the scientists and they're instead of just throwing a bunch of money at them they're saying look we want you to study this this is this particular aspect and maybe hopefully it will be chemicals hopefully it will be um, xenoestrogens um, hopefully it will be something that these organizations are telling these scientists, we're not just going to write you a blank check. We're going to tell you that these are the things we want you to focus on because we know they're causing breast cancer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's really, really exciting. Um, and last but not least, I wanted to talk about the two books that um, I've been referring to throughout most of this discussion. Um, they are both funded by breast cancer. Um, excuse me, they're both funded by Breast Cancer Fund, um, which, and you can go to their website and they have these lovely cards that talk about um, household exposures and um, using cleaning products and all kinds of things and the ones that have the nasty products in them. So that is a book called State of the Evidence. Um, that's the one that I talked about was um, published by, or excuse me, written by Janet Gray, who was funded by Breast Cancer Fund. 
And then the one that I refer to about the early age of puberty is called the falling age of puberty mm. in the U.S. girls. And that, again, is about these eight and nine-year-olds um, getting their periods. Yeah. Well. So I hope that we have generated, you know, some discussion um, and... Um, I just really wanted to thank uh, Dr. Getson and Leisha for having me um, because I always welcome any opportunity to educate and have a discussion and um, try to encourage women uh, to do something about prevention. Mm, that's great. We do have a couple of questions, Anne. Okay. Um, Going back to the vitamin D, you said that the vitamin D3 levels, normal level should be 50 in women. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Now, there's a, there are people taking a lot of vitamin D, you know, 5,000 milligrams, 2,000 milligrams. Actually, it's international units, but right, I know what you mean. Yes, right. Yes. So is that the same as the vitamin D3? And, and well, it has to say vitamin D3. And, okay. you know, let's just dispel the myth right here and now that you can absorb vitamin D3 from milk. Um, okay. You can't. Okay, so the only true source of vitamin D3 is the sun. Um, that brings up its own issues. Um, so if you measure someone's vitamin D3, it's a, called vitamin D3 25 hydroxy. That's how it looks on the form for the lab. Um, vitamin D3, as I said before, is a fat soluble vitamin. It's actually a hormone. It is stored in fat. So you can take 5,000 international units. I mean, I get people all the time whose vitamin D3 level is 17. Well, okay. that's a long way from 50. Right. But if they take 5,000 international units a day for three months, and then you remeasure their vitamin D3, it should be at a good level, say 45 or 50. And then you say, okay, you're there. You can maintain your vitamin D3 by taking a thousand international units a day. Because again, as I said, it's stored in fat. You're not peeing it out like you would with B B6 or B12 or folic acid. Those are water soluble vitamins. We pee them out every day. They have to be replaced every day um, in some way. But vitamin D3 is stored in fat, and it will hang out there, if you will, for a long time um, by just maintaining it. And that would be a dose of, say, 1,000 international units. Okay, so that makes sense. So taking that 5,000 international units to get your levels where they need to be, then going on a maintenance. Right, so and rechecking them. So it takes about three months to bring your level up. If you're, you know, if you're taking the right kind of vitamin D3, if you're taking it every day, et cetera, et cetera, um, you know, go have it checked again. I mean, this is actually a billable ICD-9 code um, called vitamin D3 deficiency. Um, insurance pays for it. I mean, you know, because mm -hmm. it's, of course, we currently link it a lot to bone deficiency and osteoporosis, but honestly, it's it's great for your immune system, mm, right. including the breast. I mean, we're finding that the vitamin D deficiency is is um, epidemic, if you will, in the Northeast Corridor. I mean, look at the winters that we go through. Right. Um, look at the amount of sun exposure that we allow ourselves because... You don't want the detri detrimental effects of the sun. So um, you prove it to people over and over again. Oh, I'm gardening and I'm going to the beach. And then you check their vitamin D3 level and it's 35. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And right. so that you want this vitamin D3 to be at a higher level um, for all of its benefits. Right. Okay. Thank you. A uh, question on the BPA, if it gets stored in the fat cells, how can we get it out? 
Um, again, I think, at, first of all, don't store fat. <laughs> no, okay, because that's a good point. There you go. <laughs> no, but, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm being facetious. But, yeah. you know, if you are overweight, you have a lot more storage area, if you will, um, than someone who is fairly lean. So it's interesting that there's been quite a number of studies about um, women who lose a fair amount of weight, especially around their middle, when they start breaking that fat down, they're releasing all of that, um, those chemicals and estrogen into circulation. It's like when you go get a massage mm -hmm. and, you know, they, they push all your tissue and all this um, you know, the toxins get released into your bloodstream and you drink lots of water and you pee it out. Well, that's mm -hmm. pretty much what happens when we eat those good foods. So as we eat better food, you know, the vegetables and the fruits and all that, um, all of those antioxidants, um, if you keep your weight at a good level and you don't let your body store um, these toxins, then it's not so much of a problem. Mm -hmm. I would absolutely recommend diendolmethane. Um, I think I don't, it's not really a chelator for BPA, but certainly exercise is. I mean, I, I think, I think every woman should be on diendolmethane and that's a broad kind of, um, how shall we say, scary statement for a practitioner. Um, but I do think it's that protective. Um, and I think exercise and plenty of water and avoiding trying your best to avoid your exposure to BPA. And I'll put it right out there about microwaves right. yeah. that mine went to the end of the driveway about eight years ago. And, um, you know, so again, you're looking at these organizations that are trying to educate us about plastic plastic lime cans, water bottles, et cetera, that you, you, we know, we can look at them and say, hey, I don't want that mm -hmm. because I know it has BPA in it. Right, yeah. As far as the, uh, the, you know, people that may be overweight and having those toxins stored in their fat cells, I think it, it's, um, it speaks about the crazy, um, any sort of crazy diet where you yes. would be losing a lot of weight quickly because then those toxins are being dumped into the body and you have to make sure that you're you're getting them out. Exactly. And I and I and I that and absolutely Leisha, I mean and that goes along with, you know, making long-term changes that are sustainable. You know, right. rather than crashing, dieting and losing, you know, tons of weight and then uh, g gaining it all back because you haven't really developed habits that are long-term sustainable. Right. Yeah. Uh, we have a couple more questions. Uh, somebody asked, is there a specific type or brand of sunscreen that you would recommend? There are. That's a really good question. And there are a number of them out there. Um, there is one called Lavera. That's L as in Larry, A-V-E-R-A. -E um, I don't know anywhere around here um, that you can buy it, but you can certainly order it online. Um, Jason, J-A-S-O-N, um, is a product sold at Whole Foods. Um, that's a very good one. I have to say, I was really fortunate that even my daughters, who are 29 and 31, were the first ones to make me aware of um, these, you know, these sunscreens that don't have the chemicals in them. One of my older daughter, it has been a whitewater rafting guide. She's blonde and fair and blue eyed. And you can imagine the amount of sunscreen that she would use in a day. And she was the first person who said, hey, mom, you know, I, I found this stuff um, that doesn't have PABA in it and all the nastiness. Um, most of them are um, usually, uh, I'm, it's the, oh, it's the white, I'm, why am I blanking on it, oxide, I can't think of the word um, at the moment. But, you know, yeah, they're dark, you know, they're white, and my yeah. daughter's calling me the clown, mm -hmm. I'm putting on my clown makeup. But, you know, that's the safest stuff out there. 
I, I'll be honest with you. I'm a uh, sun lover. I love being out in the sun. So what I do is I ingest ingest coconut oil and I take astaxanthin. So right. those, those two things act as a um, kind of a natural sunscreen. Yeah. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't go laying and baking out in the sun, but I spend a good deal of time out there. And so, you know, you use your your common sense. Maybe be under an umbrella, wear a hat you know, long sleeves if you have to. But I, I feel strongly that people should get maybe at least 10 minutes a day yes. of direct yes. sun without any sunscreen, even mm -hmm. without without sunglasses to let that sun, that vitamin, that sun penetrate into their eyes also. So Absolutely. And I've, I know what I was trying to think of was zinc oxide. Yes, somebody um, just typed that up there. Yeah, zinc, yeah, yeah. zinc oxide. Thank you for your help on that yeah. one. Also, I've heard um, some of the... Uh, the people talk about vitamin E ingesting, you know, 800 I use of vitamin E is also supposed to be very good for preventing sunburn. Oh, okay. I'll write that one down. And it uh, looks like we have another question. Is soy such as edamame harmful or only the chemical soy? I, I, edamame is certainly not harmful. And, you know, you're, again, most of our our information and our use of soy is coming from Asia. So remember that all the soybeans in the United States used to be sent to Asia or used as animal feed. Um, and then someone came up with this idea, which is a myth, um, that you can, because soy is so estrogenic, that you know it would stop hot flashes and that Asian women don't have hot flashes. Well, that was a myth. But on the other hand, they do have lower rates of breast cancer. And they talk about the benefit of soy. Again, look at how Asians eat soy. They eat it as edamame, miso soup, tofu. So the long-winded answer to your question is edamame is perfectly safe. Um, and that it is estrogenic, but in a positive way. And one of the things they attribute to why they have a lower rate of breast cancer in Asia is because their, their children grow up on soy, mm -hmm. on the good kind of soy. So they're, you know, they're, they're ingesting soy from, you know, the time they can start eating. Um, and this is what they consider extremely beneficial um, because they've started, you know, they've started ingesting it under the age of 20. I mean, they're babies, essentially, yeah, when they right. start. Right. Well, this has been um, very, very informative, and we thank you so much for your time. Is there anything you'd like to close with? Anything else you'd like to add? Um, I just wanted to thank um, you again, Leisha, for having me and Dr. Getson for setting this up. Um, I did want to say that you can certainly contact me um, via phone. Everyone has my cell phone number. It's certainly not a secret. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to give out my cell phone number um, for I do have an office in Wayne. Um, I am in private practice there and I'm happy to talk to people on the phone. And also, if you're interested in having a thermogram, um, I'm sure Leisha is going to provide information about how you can contact her. Yes. Well, let me give you Anne's um, contact information. Anne's office is at 200 Eagle Road, Stratford Building 2. She's in Suite 208, and that is in Wayne, PA, 19087. Her, her phone number is 610-687-7895. Again, that's 610-687-7895. And Anne's website is www.annemcleodsneath.com. And we'll have all of this information available for you. Uh, if anybody would like to contact Anne, her PowerPoint presentation will be available as well as this webinar in about a week or so on our website, on our webinar page. So once again, Anne, thank you so much for taking the time for giving us this um, very important information. And you gave us a lot of, uh, lot of things to think about in ways that we can uh, become proactive uh, in 
taking care of ourselves. Okay, thank you too, Lisha. Okay, so next month, uh, we hope you join us on Wednesday, June 24th. Our speaker, our presenter will be Dr. Elizabeth Boyle. Dr. Boyle is a board certified obstetrician and gynecologist, and she has a Master of Science in Metabolic and Nutritional Medicine. She will be discussing food sensitivities slash allergies and their relationship to chronic disease. So I think that covers it for tonight, everybody. We want to thank you for uh, participating and for joining us, and we wish you all a good night.